Welcome everyone, all the attendees, um, to our ACCE Young Entrepreneurs Group webinar called Roads Leading to Asia. I'm Jesse Ma and I will be your MC for this event. Asia is home to some of the most powerful markets. At this webinar, we will be exploring some common challenges and misconceptions of doing business in Asia, and you will hear some practical tips and experiences from entrepreneurs and government officials to help you successfully do business in Asia. The webinar will consist of three fireside chats featuring a panel of prominent guest speakers, followed by three simultaneous breakout sessions, allowing for Q&A and networking between the panelists and the attendees. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Kevin O. Young, our president of ACCE, to share his greetings. Uh, hello, uh, good morning, everyone. I guess. Uh around noontime. Everyone, welcome to the ACC Rose Leading to Asia webinar again, uh, hosted by our Young Entrepreneur Group. I'm Kevin O'Young from the uh, Association of Chinese Canadian Entrepreneurs, ACCE. Um, uh, entrepreneurs are constantly looking at growth opportunities in Asia, and uh, it has been one of the fastest growing markets pre and post pandemic. Today, we're very fortunate uh, to have invited a rooster of experts and accomplished panelists from government bank and industries to share with us their experiences and insight and to shed light on the opportunities uh, for our members. Uh, I'd like to th uh, take uh, this moment to thank um, all the panelists today for their time uh, and they will be joining us just like Jesse mentioned different parts of the discussions uh, and they are uh, Emily Mo, Director of Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, uh, Sue Ralph, Deputy Director from Foreign Affairs and International Trade Canada, Chris Bennett, Manager of International Trade, uh, National Bank of Canada. Hua Yu, Managing Director, Level 5 Strategy. Uh, Toby Chu, Chairman of, and CEO of CIBT Education Group, also our West Coast Co-Chair. Uh, Lindsay Lau, CEO of in, in, Inlight. Kevin Sullivan, Senior Manager from uh, EDC. Raymond Zhu, Senior Manager, uh, uh, Greater China Trade and Industry uh, Development Division, uh, BC Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. Um, uh, before uh, we begin, I'd like to thank uh, our sponsor, National Bank, Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office in Toronto, Invest Hong Kong, and our, uh, and our other supporting partners. Uh, one more thing, I'd like to remind everyone that the upcoming virtual ACC Awards Gala on April 24th. Uh, this has been traditionally our signature event, and we are going to uh, reimagine this in the virtual hybrid format. Please visit our website for more information, uh, and we look forward to sharing with you the stories of this year's awards recipient then. And for now, let's get started, and thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I would now like to introduce you to our first panel of speakers. Our moderator will be our very own Ben Hum, Chair of the ACCE Young Entrepreneurs Committee. And our first panelist for today are Chris Bennett, Manager of International Trade at National Bank of Canada, and Hua Yu, Managing Partner of Level 5 Strategy. This fireside chat is focused on propelling brands in Asia and reporting to Asia. Ben, take it away. Thanks, Jesse, for that wonderful introduction, and Kevin for highlighting the event uh, for this afternoon, and welcome, everyone. For this first session with Chris Bennett and Hua Yu, I will be providing some questions, some key questions about the roads leading to Asia, and of course, trying to avoid some of the potholes, because um, there are many challenges, and we have some very experienced um, leaders with us and sharing their experiences. So the first question I'm going to pose to Chris is uh, from the um, National Bank of Canada is what are some of the key risks that that exporters will face uh, and as well as how can they mitigate these risks? Thank you very much Ben. Um, so we yeah, have some of the key risks uh, that uh, let's say exporters face um, non so this is really when your customers uh, either can't pay or they don't want I don't want to listen to question where some so non-payment risk would be one um, currency risk so once again if we're if, you know if you're an exporter and 
Um, the U.S. dollar would would absolutely in dollar. Uh, the ren renminbi would come into play. Uh, there's currency risk there where you're you're trying to crystallize right your profit margin. So uh, there's I don't know. It's, uh, risk trend. Um, you know, for any new exporter, uh, just nap ship prop or and or services to be daunting. So, uh, that's that's certainly another two risks there transportation and logistics. Uh, a couple other risks would be political and legal. So these are all risks that uh, experienced uh, exporters and and you know uh, exposed to. So some of the key ways to uh, bend, if we're talking. Without overly complicating it, it can it can really be a simple um, accounts receivable insurance from Export Development Canada, okay? Or there's other there's other um, credit insurance companies, help you, uh, Euler, Coface, Atradius. These are some of the larger ones that operate in Canada. Export Development Canada. I know what National Bank is certainly one of one of my largest partners and one of the bank's largest partners. One way of mitigating non-payment risk. Um, the currency risk when we talk about where, you know, if you're exporting to China, let's say, uh, typically you're, you know, you're probably going to be paid in U.S. dollars. You're in maybe in Canadian dollars if you're manufacturing product in Canada. Um, so, you know, once again, to you would want to crystallize or lock in. Uh, your margin, and you can do that through foreign exchange or currency hedging. Um, so FX or currency hedging, you know, is one way that you can do that. That can get quite complex. So once again, um, my advice would be, you know, you talk to your bank. In this case, it could be National Bank, but it could be other banks as well. You get in touch with their foreign exchange a trade risk management solutions from at National. And there to, to uh, your foreign exchange, okay? The key there is to determine how much your exposure is, but that can be done with your uh, with the help of a trader. Transportation, this once again, I think I the way today would be to get a very good six partners, right? There, there's plenty of them out there, um, you know, in Canada that can navigate you know the the rules and regulations your look for that ended and one to political or legal once again the logistics could come into play but so could something like it's from X that's a uh, Ben well, thanks a lot, Chris. And I'm sure that these okay, risks are just compounded with the pandemic as well. So, um, so having with these risks in mind, uh, let's jump to Hua Yu, uh, managing partner at Level Five Strategy. With, ben, were you uh, able to hear me or no? Uh, with what are some of the key five elements to think through before even launching our brand into Asia? Well, thank you, Ben. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're coming okay, through loud and clear. Good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so when we talk about going to uh, any market, um, in, in, in this case, it's Asian market, it's always good to step back and take a deep look of what is truly going on in this particular market, especially when we talk about something very different and com complicated market like Asia. So when we advise our client, we always ask them to keep mind into those five areas um, I'm going to talk through. The first one is the category. So the question I'm going to ask um, anybody who want to enter to the Asian market is, how is the category you are in performing in Asia? 
Is this a growing category? Is this an emerging category? What gonna drive this category growing or emerging in Asia? Are there any innovations, technology in, the, in, in this category? So let's say uh, if you're in the skincare industry, COVID-19 obviously has pushed the skincare and beauty categories in, in China into such a high consumption, mostly through the e-commerce online uh, sales. So if your company is planning to go to China and selling the same product, so the question I just mentioned becoming very, very critical for you to explore because to fully understand the overall market trend and understand you are in the growth category will allow you, truly allow you to capture the opportunities for day one. You don't want to go to a category which is not, not rising, right? <laughs> so the second is really competitor. So again, let's use the skincare products as an, as an example. So before you go to the Asian market, you really, really need to be aware how competitive and saturated that market is. So it is critical to spend some time to study who are the major players, who are the emerging players, how do they reach their target consumers? What can we learn from them? That's very important. What can we learn from them? And are there any, are there any market gaps maybe we will be able to fill, which, which the chance is very small, but I think you still need to take a look. So to fully understand your competitors and understand what they're doing will really, really help you to identify your true opportunities and honestly, just to avoid some unnecessary conflict. The third one is, to my, in my mind, is the most, most important one, is to understand your consumer. So the question I'm going to ask is, who are your consumers in, in Asia? What drives consumers to purchase your product and services? Why Asian consumers want to choose you versus the others? What is your clear value proposition in the Asian market? Are the Asian consumers' behavior different than those, com those consumers in North America? And if so, what are the gaps? And how can we adjust our, adjust our approach to close those gaps? And are there any consumer behavior differences between tier one cities in China and the rest of the country? Uh, what will be the potential market size for your product services in each tier? And are you going to attract a large group of consumers or position yourself as a niche player? So I think uh, to fully understand uh, the consumer's behaviors and the trends, I think it is very, very important for North American companies, anyone who want to enter to the Asian market. What sells well in Canada may not sell well in China. So even for the really some of the well-known brands like Tim Hortons and Starbucks, they made a tremendous amount of efforts to customize their products, which possibly you know, you're never going to see them in North American market, but they do this just to meet the local consumer needs. So fundamentally, I have to say the Chinese consumers or any other Asian consumers, they're not lacking choices. As a company to fully own a clear value proposition that gives your target consumer enough reason to at least try your product is critical. The number four area we need to focus is the channel. So that's, a, you know, the channel, right? So what would be the most effective channels to sell your product and services? Is it e-commerce, is it retail models, is it joint venture, is it trading partners? Can we partner with any local companies such as the supply chain partners, sales partners, promotion partners? Are there any new emerging, emerging channels happening in Asia that we can learn from? Again, I wanna use the beauty product as an example. This is such a competitive category in China. Companies already selling those kind of products all over the place, like Taobao, Tianmao, Xiaohongshu, WeChat stores, and of course, retail stores. So in reality, it really needs, um, there are just so many, so many channels we can use, but it will take some time and a lot of efforts for you to eventually get it right. But at least in the beginning, we should push ourselves to ask those questions and try to identify at least one effective channel to start with. Last one is our, our own company's readiness. So what is your company's overall objectives in Asian market? Do you really understand the complexity when you enter the Asian market? Do you have the skills, competency, relationships to do business in Asia? Do you really understand the potential challenges? Because you know, I've worked with so many clients, goals are very easy to set. Vision missions are very easy to say. But however, the question I just asked could be the most challenging for many companies to truly allow them to step back and understand if we are ready to go to the Asian market. So long story short, five key areas, category, competitors, consumers, channels, and our own company's readiness. So spend some time to address those, what I call five Cs, will help you to successful, successfully launch your brand in China, at least a starting point.
or any other international market. <laughs> these are great five points, Wa. And um, I was wondering if these might be shifted or any different uh, be in between a B2C or a B2B type of approach in terms of uh, the um, product going to Asia. Yes, uh, the B2B and B2C, you're asking a great question. So the number three, when I said the, uh, the consumer, but the B2B market is really customers. So if you understand the difference between consumers and the customer, consumer is your end users, right? Customer is really the partners, the B2B, the bigger clients. So the same question I will ask um, if it's applying to the customers instead of the uh, consumers. Great. And would you say that Asia has a very good appetite for Western brands right now? That's a tricky question, actually. <laughs> I think that question we can also talk about in the in later uh, part of the conversation. Um, you know, I've been thinking about for companies going to Asia. Is this the right time to go? There are so many political reasons. Maybe it's not the right time. Um, but again, I want to. What I want to say is, um, if you look at the, the Canadian market. Um, if you think about the numbers, like I, I got these numbers, by 2030, the newcomer minorities in Canada are expected to account for one third of the Canada's population. And among this group, really South Asian and China are ranking number two, number one and number two. So this already provides a large population sample to, for the company to understand the Chinese and South Asian consumer behaviors and build the brand loyalty before the companies even go to the local market. So why not? using this opportunity, rather than go to China, go to Asia, which is culturally different and politically complicated, why not using some of your efforts and money and investment to truly understand your consumers through the local communities? Because the sample, the Chinese sample, South Asian samples are really large enough for any company to do that. Thank you, Wa. And uh, with the time we have left, we're just gonna pose one more question to Chris. Um, with trying to mitigate risk, uh, are they very much similar uh, and applicable to an importer situation versus an exporter situation? Uh, ben, really, it's it, it's very similar. Okay, um, the challenges regarding an importer. Ben, I take it is that correct? Ben. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the challenges will face are, are very, very similar to an exporter. So there really aren't uh, any key uh, key differentiators there. Maybe one thing I'll, I'll mention though, Ben, would be just some advice that I the folks on the line about, um, you know, when they're approaching do this very quickly. And, and we can maybe follow up in a breakout room, but um, whether you're an importer or an exporter, when you go to approach the bank, uh, just a couple real quick pieces of it. Banking for a number of years. Number one, know your business, right? So make, um, you know, even if you have a PowerPoint presentation, when you go in to sit down with a commercial banker or an international trade banker like myself, um, you know, make sure you know your business. Make sure you understand uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Know what your ask is, all right, as well. So. Um, Looking for financing support? Are you looking for risk mitigation? Are you looking for advice? Are you looking for contacts? Um, you know, make sure that you know what your ask is. Um, know a little bit how commercial banking operates, okay? And what I mean by that is that, you know, make sure that you're aware that banks really, especially with entrepreneurs, banks tend to advance financing on collateral. Okay, so that's very important to know going into the meeting um, and, and just be prepared for that type of discussion with, with the bank. A um, couple other quick things, be bold and ask questions. Don't be shy, right? You guys have done a great job, um, you know, being an entrepreneur and, and, and developing a business. Leverage your time with the bank. The bank can really connect you. Let's say National Bank in this case. We Export Development Canada or trade commissioners or, you know, in credit insurance brokers or, you know, could be international trade lawyers, that sort of thing. So don't be shy, be bold. You set up a great business and make sure you um, leverage that meeting with the bank. Um, make sure you support, make sure you pick a bank that uh, supports entrepreneurs as well. So 
Then to summarize, on, uh, importers and exporters, very similar challenges. And uh, when you have that meeting, that initial meeting with the bank, I hope that was some good advice and I can allow a breakout session as well. Yeah, thank you. I'd certainly invite all our attendees to have your questions ready uh, for our panelists this afternoon at our hosted breakout sessions later on this event. Jesse? All right. Thank you, um, Chris and, and Paul, for all of those practical tips and um, for delivering such an insightful discussion. Um, I'd like to invite you now to our next session. Um, it will be a session with Am Emily Mo, Director of Hong Kong Economic Tr and Trade Office in Toronto. Um, and she will be sharing some insights on the top business sectors that are thriving in Hong Kong why the Hong Kong landscape is ideal for entrepreneurs right now, and the various government funding schemes to support Hong Kong and foreign SMEs. Hi. Um, hello, everyone. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. I would like to begin by thanking ACCE for organizing the event and also the wonderful panel who is going to share their firsthand experience in doing business in Hong Kong and glowing global. I believe that many of us here today uh, have family members or friends from Hong Kong or have connection to the city. Hong Kong is known as a highly dynamic city and it serves as the perfect platform for Canadian business to enter the fast growing Asian market. Not just because of its prime location in Asia or its proximity to mainland China, but also on um, the business culture that you are so used to. Hong Kong share with Canada by having the common law system, rule of law, robust IP protection, strong professional support in a bilingual business environment, and the free flow of information and capital. It boasts actually one of the largest Canadian communities abroad, meaning that you have easy access and strong support uh, from the like-minded Canadians working or living in the city. But one appeal that you won't want to miss out is the city has a really simple and low tax system. So against this background, Hong Kong is Asia's CBD serving as an operational base for over 9,000 overseas and mainland companies now, including 200 from Canada. As a world-leading global banking and financial hub, Hong Kong is the world's largest offshore renminbi business center and leading destination for China's FDI outflow. So in the past decade, Hong Kong has been among the top five global IPO um, raising markets ranking first for seven out of the past 12 years in terms of IPO funds raised. This means that the city can mean a source of new funding to your company. Hong Kong is now part of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, which has a GDP similar to uh, Canada's GDP size and offers new and exciting opportunities for companies from around the world. Beyond mainland China, ASEAN is Hong Kong's second biggest trading partners in good and the fourth largest in services. Last November, uh, Koshi Tart announced their entry into the Asian market via the acquisition of the Circle K chain in Hong Kong. This amplified Canadian uh, companies' confidence in Hong Kong in having Hong Kong as their springboard for expansion into Asia. And because of the city's role as a world-leading global banking and financial hub, the relevant sectors are thriving in Hong Kong. The city's appeal also extends to a wide variety of industry. Last year, fintech, e-commerce, supply chain management, logistics technology, and professional or consultancy services had the largest number of startups in Hong Kong. Despite the economic challenges brought about um, by COVID in 2020, there were over 3,300 startups in Hong Kong, and it is worth to note that there is an increase of 6% from the previous year. So the solar startup ecosystem in Hong Kong has boasted eight unicorns. Hong Kong also offers a fertile startup systems and environment that is supported by various public and private initiatives, helping entrepreneurs turn great ideas into reality. For instance, the Hong Kong SAL government offers a range of support and resources from subsidies, funding schemes, free consultancy services, and connection to the business community. 
on this. Our investment promotion team in Canada, together with their uh, teammates based in Hong Kong and other parts of the world, provides entrepreneurs that wish to expand to Hong Kong with such kind of support and resources. The moderator of the coming up discussion panel, Grace, is from our investment promotion team. So companies in Canada are always welcome to contact Grace or myself for any question on your expansion into Hong Kong. I wish all of you a fruitful experience at this webinar and a successful business in Asia in future. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for such an insightful discussion. Our next fireside chat will focus on how our North American entrepreneurs have been able to expand their businesses into Asia via Hong Kong. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our next speakers. Our moderator will be Grace Lau, Deputy Head of Investment Promotion in Best Hong Kong, Canada. And our two panel speakers is an education and real estate innovator, Toby Chu, Chairman and CEO of CIBT Education Group, Inc. from Vancouver. And our second panel speaker is Bespoke Lighting and Decor Manufacturer, Lindsay Lau. CEO of InLight, all the way from Los Angeles. All right, Grace, it's all yours. Thank you. So let me just take a look. Is Toby and Lindsay also online? I think we're just waiting for them right now, actually. <laughs> Thank you. So in this meantime, thank you so much, Jesse, and thank you, Emily, for the introduction as well, too. And I would like to take an opportunity to thank Kevin and also Karen from ACCE, you know, for helping us um, out with this uh, particular um, opportunity, you know, to speak. And the roads leading to Asia, I think this will be a very fitting topic for our two wonderful speakers coming up, Toby Chu and Lindsay Lau. Both of them have a lot of experience in this area. And once, Jesse, if you can let me know when they're both online, that'd be great. Uh, yep. Toby and, and Lindsay, they're both waiting for approval as well. Yes, I will let you know once they are both online. Thank you. So just to take this opportunity to share, just like what uh, Emily shared earlier, Chris Chen, the head of investment promotion unit in the, uh, at the Canada office with myself as well, we are more than happy to help out any Canadian businesses who wish to actually set up shop in Hong Kong or also if they're interested in looking at Hong Kong as a pivot point to go into Asia. We will gladly help everyone out. And um, if you go to our booth, you can look for our uh, email address there. And also there's a video to share more about Hong Kong. And later on in the breakout sessions, we uh, would love to invite you to join us and you can ask a lot more questions. And just to let you know as well too, um, we have some events coming up. There's going to be one, which I think will be exciting for a lot of entrepreneurs, is that um, the Hong Kong, the Global um, Acceleration Academy and the Hong Kong, Sci uh, Hong Kong Science Technology Park, they have actually just launched the Global Matching 2021. And um, it's ongoing. The deadline will come up on April 16, 2021. So there's about three weeks time where um, people from different industries, especially the eight industries that you'll be interested in would be, just share with you quickly, is consumer services, education, manufacturing and logistics, travel and hospitality, banking, financial services and insurance, healthcare, construction and real estate, government and smart city. And there's a lot of companies that you'll be really excited um, to actually participate with. Especially I can share a few, like there's gonna be um, AIA Hong Kong and Macau, Airport Authority Hong Kong, Baxter, Baya Healthcare, Cathay Pacific Airways, China Chem Group, Da Chong Hong Logistics, Fuji Xerox, Grosvenor Asia, Human Health, Ingram Micro China, Jepson, Kaixing Management Services, Lenovo, Merck's Hong Kong Limited, MTR, Mandarin or Rental Hotel Group, Morgan Watch Company, Mezuho Bank, Pfizer Corporation Hong Kong, SCORE, Zurich Insurance Hong Kong, and many more. So as you can see, this is going to be really exciting 
for those of you who actually would like to participate in this global matching service. And on top of that, you do not need to have a company in Hong Kong to be part of this. So later on, if you're interested, I'll be more, uh, Chris and myself would be more than happy to share more information about this Corporate Innovation Summit Global Matching 2021. And Jesse, we're still just waiting for Lindsay, is that right? Yeah, we're still waiting for Lindsay right now. Um, just a bit of a technological lag. No worries, that's what happens with all of us. Toby, how are you doing? Hey, good, thanks. Good morning. Wonderful. Yeah. Final block here, so good morning still. <laughs> good, <laughs> good, morning good afternoon to for you. you. Yeah. Thank you for waking up early uh, from Vancouver to come and join us today. And for those of you who are not aware, I just want to share with you as well that Toby actually is also um, have a listed company on the Toronto Stock Exchange and also on the OTCQX in the US. So mm -hmm. for those who would love to learn a lot more about you know, listings as well, as you know, it's a really hot topic in Asia um, and globally, please ask uh, Toby later on. He'll be joining us as well in the um, breakout session. All right. Well, thank you very much, Grace, and, and for all of the informative sessions that are coming up as well. If you can please share with everyone, maybe on the chat afterwards, I think a lot of our attendees would be very much interested in those sessions. Absolutely. So maybe I'll just start with Toby first while we wait for Lindsay. Now, Toby, I know we haven't been able to fly, right, for a long time, past a year, and we haven't been able to go to Hong Kong. I'm sure there's some really good food and restaurants that you probably miss. Is there anything that you might miss? I haven't been flying for so long. I even miss the airplane foods. <laughs> <laughs> and believe it or not, I start looking for my seat belts when I have dinner at home. That's how bad it's been. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people probably feel the same way, just like how you are right now. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure once you know we get we all get vaccinated and it's safe to travel again, we will probably do the same thing. But I'm sure there are many people out there who are feeling like you right now who can't wait um, to try the airplane food again. So maybe you can share with us, how did you start your company and why did you start that? How did that idea come along? Well, I I was just getting, after college, I worked for somebody for about seven years, also attended the, uh, the military services in Canada and then finally decided I want to manage my own business. So I started in 1986, beginning with the uh, personal computer business. At that time, it was hot. Uh, and by 1994, we've decided to expand the computer training school that we mm -hmm. have to China. Yes. Oh, I uh, see it. I'm on yeah, and, and we have decided to export the soft skill instead of the hardware because we are worried that, you know, accounts receivable in China back in 1980s, as far as inventory gone missing. Uh, but the idea didn't fly because we could not compete against some of the, uh, the, the staff sent in from China, uh, from India. Uh, they were able to to uh, expatriate their staff to China at a pretty low cost, and we are not able to compete. Uh, so we switched gear and brought the MBA program to China offered by City University of Seattle. Uh, we saw the need for West style, Western style management for China when the world was investing into China during the 90s. Uh, our Chinese students worked for multinationals invested in China, and they double or triple their earnings after they earn a Western degree. Uh, so by 2004, we, we became the biggest MBA program in China with nearly 100 million RMB in revenue at that time. That's a lot of money in 2004. Uh, by 2007, we switched gear and start focusing back to Canada. We bought Sprockshaw College in the West Coast here with 103, 110 years now of, uh, of uh, uh, experience in Canada. And we start importing students from Asia, not just China, from uh, Thailand, from Malaysia, from uh, Vietnam, etc. Uh, and today we educate about 11,000 students in Canada and by 2017 we expanded our B2B model uh, and also to create student housing for all these students coming to study in uh, Vancouver. Uh, so we supply student housing rental apartments to uh, 72 schools in the lower mainland here in Vancouver from 77 countries. So today we have 46 locations, uh, including schools, rental apartments, hotel, and three education super centers, uh, both operational and under development. So that's our humble beginning and where we are. Wow, that's amazing. And I remember I heard the story about you starting the company with only $3,000, am I correct? That was a lot of money at that time, anyways. <laughs> at least to well, me, it's a lot of money. 
And your portfolio now is at what? Over 1.5 billion. Amazing. And I think Lindsay had mentioned this before. And welcome, Lindsay, to join us. Hi, All guys. Congress, you're here. Um, was that it's a part of a top notch ROI, right? Yes. You know, coming from yeah, that. Absolutely. So, for all those out there, you know, who want to learn from Toby, $3,000 investment to turn it into a $1.5 billion. Like That's truly really a unicorn there. There's a unicorn right there, yeah. as you said, Lindsay. So, Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Toby, for sharing. Now, Lindsay, we just asked Toby a really fun question. It's like, you know, how many will fly to Hong Kong? So, what do you miss about Hong Kong restaurant or food? Is there something you miss? Well, every time I go to Hong Kong, I try to hit at least these two restaurants, Yonggei in Lan Gui Fong and Gao Gei Ngao Lam in Shanghai. So, oh, delicious. I haven't had that in about two years now. <laughs> We're going on two years now, so yes, I'm craving it. Oh, likewise. So maybe you can share a bit more with us as well, too. Um, how and why did you come up with uh, the idea of going into like uh, upholstery and also bespoke lighting, and especially for females going in this area, is very unusual. I call myself the accidental entrepreneur <laughs> because um, you know I. Previously, I had a I had a career in the corporate life, you know, as an employee uh, it, with one of the big sixes at the time. Um, but then, when I was in Hong Kong, my dad got really sick, and uh, I took time off um, to attend to him. And you know, it really gave me the new perspective of what was really important because I was traveling so much. I was getting on the plane, unlike Toby. As soon as I got on the Cathay Pacific flight, I. I like I was repulsed by the smell of the flight uh, after a while. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, after you know he got sick, uh, I really thought about what was most important to me, and that was the ability to manage my own time. And I thought being my own entrepreneur would give me that uh, ability do, to do so. But little did I realize that as an entrepreneur, you've got to struggle the first several years <laughs> to get you that uh, flexibility with timing. So yeah, that's how it all started. But how did we go into lighting? Uh, we actually started in upholstery first uh, because I partnered up with my sister who was a, who was a uh, textile major in, in college. And so, cause I had no real skills. I, I just had accounting finance skills, you know? So I had no tangible skills, I would say. So we went the route of upholstery and we uh, tried to uh, market ourselves to hospitality, the hotel industry. Um, and so one thing led to another. And when my client wanted lighting, um, we thought, okay, well, we'll help you source lighting. And little did I know our hometown of Jongsan produced about 45% of the world's lighting. So there we go. That's our little, you know, uh, secret that we discovered. Um, and that's how we got into lighting. Wow, fascinating. And I understand you also have a Canadian connection here. Yes. Yeah, so we met up with a, a Canadian company that was very strong in the hospitality market. They were probably one of the top three uh, bespoke lighting manufacturers in North America at the time. And they wanted to expand into, into um, China. And so we were initially their sourcing arm, uh, quality controlling everything for them, but it turned out to be much harder than we thought. So we decided, look, you know, if you're really serious about China, then let's start a factory together. And that's how we created the joint venture with them. Um, but shortly after we did that, the, the financial um, crisis hit in 2009 and they were uh, over leveraged at the time and um, they went uh, bankrupt. So during that time, we took the opportunity to, um, to take over uh, their, their business and uh, you know, started our own uh, North America distribution um, company here in uh, Los Angeles, based in Los Angeles. But we still have uh, some, some presence in Montreal uh, because our technical guys are still there working with us. So we've been doing this for about 15 years now. Um, so I do have uh, a warm spot for the Canadians um, and that's partly the reason I'm here. Thank you. And I think one of the stories that most of you can actually hear or listen or understand is that you actually need a lot of uh, confidence 
you have to believe in your instincts when you're actually starting up your own business. And as you can see from both to Toby and Lindsay's um, examples, they actually, you know, grabbed on the opportunity and actually just flew with it and, and actually said, you know, let's not look behind, let's look forward. I think that's the most important part. And I'll take that a gift from you. Um, now, I understand, you know, both of you actually, aside from having, you know, offices in, in Canada, um, you know, for Toby and for Lindsay in the US, you've also set up office in Hong Kong, but you've also utilized Hong Kong to pivot into Asia and also mainland China. Maybe um, I can start off with Toby first. You can share a bit more about what you've been doing and why you want to consider, you know, why did you consider using Hong Kong as a key place to set up um, uh, your office for Asia Pacific? As I mentioned earlier, we expanded our education business into Asia and, and China obviously is a, is a big market uh, and we did a gateway into China in 1994 for our education business uh, and Hong Kong obviously became the natural springboard to enter the Chinese market. The rules of laws, trans transfer of funds and on the infrastructures are in place so that was very helpful. Uh, and. Uh, it's a, it's a big consumer market. And, and at that time, again, you know, different product events on, on a different timing. Uh, our education business educates Chinese youth and, and uh, adults into Western skill management, MBA program, for example, to manage the, um, uh, the, the Western company entering. Uh, after they graduated, they earned, they earned twice or three times more money. So it was a, a, a good product and the right product. Uh, and, and that's how we sort of continue to thrive. And today we still have over 1,000 students uh, in China, or well, actually 1,200 as of last week, uh, and, uh, and 10,000 are in Canada. And we just switch our, our mode uh, by bringing in students from China to Canada so that they can also experience the Canadian culture. And, and, and we use Hong Kong as our springboard and, uh, and our financial clearing centers. Oh, wonderful. Um, so we can see, you know, definitely for Hong Kong, there's a lot of use, you know, in terms of um, as a pivot point, especially for those going into Asia. And Lindsay, what about your story? Why did you pick Hong Kong? So when I started my company, I was working in Hong Kong at the time. And so for me, Hong Kong was my second home. Um, and it was for that personal reason, um, we, we decided to start the company in, in Hong Kong rather than in the U.S. Now, a, another big contributing factor was also Hong Kong's financial uh, and banking systems that is a lot more flexible than, say, here in the U.S. or in China. So for me, it was actually a no-brainer to pick the Hong Kong because it was an Asian hub. Um, and if we wanted to do any business with China, that was the ideal position to be in because it's bilingual which suits me a lot better than China because my Chinese is very rusty. Um, so, so it actually is very, very, uh, it's a very, uh, uh, I would say, fitting uh, place to start the business because of who I am and where I want to go. Mm -hmm. And did you find like, uh, was tax, like what corporate tax, you know, was that yeah, one of the reasons? corporate tax was, was 15%. Um, so it's, to me, it's, you know, of, of all the, all the countries in, in, uh, in the world, Hong Kong has one of the lowest tax rates. So definitely an added advantage. If you come from a country like North America, you know, where it's 34%. Um, so yes, in China, don't even talk about it. <laughs> China, that's a whole other, you know, can of worms. So I guess for Toby, you know, for yourself, I think, did you also find that some of the perks like with the taxation was also beneficial for your company as well? Yeah, also the tax treaty, not to mention the tax treaty between Canada and, uh, and, and Hong Kong, that's very helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. And obviously the expertise behind it with all the big four, big six accounting firms are able to provide advice. So uh, there's no surprises. We just follow the steps one at a time and, and we get to our goals. Oh. Wonderful. Now, the other area that I would love to check, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs would find it beneficial, is that do you have any um, tips? Maybe you share your top three tips in terms of for companies, uh, for entrepreneurs who want to go into Hong Kong um, or using Hong Kong as a pivot base for Asia. Do you have tips for them? So, Toby, maybe it's how you stated that first. Yeah, well, uh, my usually my, my, my advice to, to you know, new entry players is very candid and blunt. 
uh, I would always ask every company must have at least one core competency, whether it is a product or type of service, and leveraging on that core competency and continue to enhance its value chain, either vertically or horizontally. Uh, you know, meaning that lower your production costs or expand your product line into China. Uh, when my education business faces uh, the, the margin pressure, I add the student housing as an example, uh, because the two biggest expenses for international students or domestic students in Canada are tuition fees and rent. So our revenue increased by 40% when the students attended our school and also lived at our apartment. So I get paid twice. Uh, next is market share. By expanding to the new market, adds new income. But before you do that, I need to make sure that I localize my product for the new local audience. Uh, what sells in Canada doesn't mean that it sells for in the US or Asia. Even Starbucks gets killed in Italy with only 11 stores. But Donald never made it big in India with only 350 stores with over 1.37 billion people. So those are the soul searching really think about, you know, like why, why is there 350 stores of McDonald's with a country of 1.37 billion people? Because Indian people respect the cow as their god. You don't want to eat their god. So <laughs> that's not a product to go there, right? So again, you know, whatever product or services you want to bring to Asia, not just China, but whether it's Hong Kong or everywhere else, make sure that it's localized and think about the, the, the product, whether or not it's going to sell over there or you need localizations. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. And just Lindsay, I know we're almost up with time. And Lindsay, maybe you can share a few of your tips as to why, you know, people should consider um, pivoting, you know, to Hong Kong and Asia. Okay, so I'll, I'll give a more direct answer as it relates to Hong Kong. Um, so for me, uh, one of the greatest tips that I could provide is to is to make sure you tap into the uh, the uh, the talent pool of Hong Kong. Because Hong Kong is really known for efficiency, and they have a great pool of well-educated talent there. So when we started our company, uh, we hired all the right people. I would say we hired the right lawyers, we hired the right accountants, you know, um, to to help help us. And it was it made my job much much easier. And it's really easy to access all of this talent at a relatively inexpensive cost. Uh, compared to, let's say, the U.S., for example. Uh, so that, I think, is something that you might want to consider uh, if you ever want to, you know, dip your toes into uh, investing in Asia because the Hong Kong people have a lot of experience already and you don't want to be reinventing that wheel if you don't have to. Great. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And thank you, Toby. So for those who would like to find out more and have more questions for Toby and Lindsay, please join us um, in the breakout sessions later on. And thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Toby and Lindsay, for sharing your very inspirational stories. Um, I know it takes a lot of determination, discipline, and dedication to be a successful entrepreneur, and especially in several different jurisdictions as well. So, um, you know, very, very, very inspirational for sure, and it's very motivating for all of us to hear your stories. Um, and also thank you, Grace, for moderating such an engaging discussion. Um, we're now going to start with our next fireside chat. Um, so I'm going to invite our next speakers um, with our Canadian government officials, and they will be sharing how they can help businesses expand globally, particularly in Asia. It will be moderated once again by the chair of our ACCE Young Entrepreneurs Committee. Um, ben Hum, and I am honored to welcome our guest speakers, Sue Roth, Deputy Director of Foreign Affairs and International Trade Canada. Uh, we also have Kevin Sullivan here, Senior Manager of Export Development of Canada. Um, and we're just waiting for Raymond Zhu, who is logging on right now. Um, he is the Senior Manager of Greater China from the Trade and Industry Development Branch. Um, at the BC Ministry of Jobs for Economic Recovery and Innovation. Hi, Raymond. Um, so take it away. Thanks a lot, Jesse. I'd like to welcome back all our attendees to this third segment of our afternoon with you. And there are certainly many partners that we like to have 
riding shotgun with us on our road trip to Asia right now. Mm -hmm. And, and, and certainly um, with our bank partners, with ACCE, certainly helping us along. And now we are working with our government partners, which is a very important part of our road trip. Now, working with government sometimes could be challenging because there are so many different departments that we can speak to on a provincial level as well as a federal level. So perhaps our panelists could share a little bit about uh, the, the uh, area that they're from and some of the, the uh, departments that we can connect to as exporters. So you, Sue, let's, uh, let's start with you. <laughs> let's start. All right, we'll start with the, with the federal side of things. Yeah. Good, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening if we have people from, from uh, many different places. Delighted to be here um, to see the, the work that's being done. Um, to to encourage expansion, to encourage market diversification. Um, I work with the Trade Commissioner Service, which is part of Global Affairs Canada, a federal government department. Um, but I am, as, as Ben said, just one of, of many arrows in, in a quiver to help um, Canadian companies, Canadian entrepreneurs get a grip on the ecosystem that's out there that supports international business development, um, both through counseling, kind of soft skills, brainstorming, um, also funding, programming um, that, is, that is available at different stages of your journey as an entrepreneur and as a Canadian company. So we just want to, to leave you, you know, with the broad idea that there is no wrong door to come through. Um, so, you know, whether you're, you, you meet me first or, or Kevin or Raymond or a member of an association like Ben through ACCE, it doesn't matter. Please, you know, knock on the door. That's the first step that we really want you to take is that you are, uh, you're actually making uh, the entree to us. We can help facilitate those connections, the, the overall international business development ecosystem for you. But I work with the Trade Commissioner Service and I work in uh, Toronto and I'm based uh, in the Ontario Region Office. So I'm borders in with Canadian companies uh, to Ontario, though we have sister regional offices that we can connect you to as well. I'm going to stop there and let others kind of fill in some of the other uh, pieces, but they, there's lots to talk about on this, this subject, Ben. And the Trade Commissioner Service has a lot of doors that we can knock on, practically every country in the world, right? <laughs> well, and, and yeah. that's it. We're, we're encouraging that, that Canadian companies, that you use your regional presence. So that would be myself, that would be our teams in Halifax or, or Calgary um, or Vancouver, that you use them as your, your entryway because we then have uh, an ability to connect you to 160 different uh, teams across the globe. Um, those are our at post or at mission uh, teams, a trade team there. Um, but we'd love to get to know you first, um, be able to help you prepare. And that'll be another theme, I think, of this um, of this panel. And we've heard a little bit of that in the first panel as well, um, that you really need to get your preparation uh, fixed and you really need to um, have a plan in place to do the most, um, to do the best and to leverage these resources to their fullest, you're best to prepare and prepare at home. Thank you, Sue. And what we'll do now is jump to Kevin, who could tell us a bit about the Export Development Corporation of Canada and how it could actually complement some of our efforts that uh, we could work with Sue's area. Absolutely, Ben. Uh, and as, as Sue alluded to, and, and you, as well, I mean, there are there are many doors uh, to knock on, and, and certainly welcome you to to approach anyone. We work very closely uh, in partnership with the, the Trade Commissioner Service, uh, our provincial governments as, as well, federal agencies, business development, uh, and uh, as well. Uh, but specifically, EDC, if you could think of us um, very uh, very simply in, in two ways, and the two pillars of EDC. One uh, pillar of EDC is to provide you with top cover. Uh, so when you're looking at entering a new market, uh, you have an opportunity with a new customer 
uh, perhaps an existing customer in a supply chain that you're already well in, ingrained in. Uh, Toby, uh, Mr. Chu uh, mentioned it in, in the last call. Um, you know, when there is a risk of payment uh, and a risk of not getting paid, that's where EDC, uh, kind of the one uh, foundational pillar of EDC is to ensure that uh, we provide you with that top cover. Uh, so then in the event that you do not get paid, uh, we stand behind you to, uh, to make sure that you do. Uh, use it as an intelligence tool. Again, the Trade Commissioner Service does a great job at uh, helping you do upfront due diligence and making sure that you're, you are uh, getting into bed with the right partners. Um, you know, from our standpoint, all we need is a name, address, and phone number of a counterparty who you're looking to do business with. Uh, and whether it's 100,000 or 10,000 or 10 million, uh, we can give you a strong indication as to whether or not EDC would be comfortable with that risk. Uh, in China, as an example, we partner with uh, with SinoSure to help us uh, do due diligence on the ground. In other markets, we have other um, partners who, who we've been on. So pillar one is we provide you with that top cover, um, give you that assurance, that confidence, allow you to develop a relationship and knowing that you're able to offer terms uh, because it is expected um, in, in Asian markets, uh, in markets globally, particularly in, in Asian markets. And you can speak with National Bank and others with trade finance solutions available. Uh, but if there's a risk there, we'll help cover it. We'll take that off of your desk so you can focus on other things and give you the confidence of knowing that you're going to get paid at the end of the day. The second pillar is is how do you finance that? When you get the, the first order uh, that turns into a second and a third, the, the champagne is, is, is popped. Uh, but then you uh, pain inside saying, how am I going to finance this? How, is it, how am I going to flow this through my existing uh, working capital facilities? So that's where we partner uh, in partnership with Canadian banks and, and local banks in market to make sure that you've got the, the firepower that you need uh, to, to execute on that. I'll give you one quick example of um, a client that we, we met with uh, at the Trade Accelerator program uh, here in Toronto. We run it across the country. But they, had, they came to us after we did a presentation and said, look, months ago, a company in Hong Kong came to us and said, you know, they'd like to test out an order of our food products. Uh, and so ship a container and give us payment terms. And they initially had turned them down uh, because it was significant risk. They didn't know them. Uh, and we said, well, look, you know, give us their phone number, or name, address, and phone number, um, you know, test order. We'll, we'll see if we can protect it. And it came back. And in fact, it was top three um, you know, online uh, platform in, in Asia, you know, a name we probably all know now. Uh, so we said, you know, we're comfortable with this risk. We can protect it. They shipped the container. Uh, it went off very well. So from a $100,000 order, they're now doing $18 million a year in, in China alone on this one platform alone. So one thing leads to another, uh, making sure that they're, they're protected on the risk, uh, helping them finance it on the back end, uh, and allow that, that snowball to role and, uh, and confidence to be there and, uh, and business to grow. So very simply, we'll provide you with top cover and, uh, and firepower from the back end to, uh, to help you grow your business. That's great, Kevin. It sounds like that top cover is very much like rocket fuel. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's, again, I mean, it's a, it's a <laughs> lived and worked in Asia and China for, for six years. It's very much a relationship business. Um, and as, as Lindsay alluded to in the, the last one, you know, it takes that relationship. But uh, ultimately, you do need to, to grow your business with people you don't have uh, strong existing relationships with. And if you can offer them the terms that they're, they're asking for, it, uh, it helps. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And now we're going to go on a provincial level with Raymond and seeing how we could leverage some of their resources. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So <clears throat> here with you. Uh, 非常高興跟今天跟大家一起見面。大家好,好高興今日同大家一起傾偈。Uh, so I'm Raymond Zhu from the BC Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. So the short name is called Jerry. Our ministry Jerry is uh, mandated to, to help BC companies to, to export and also attract uh, investments overseas into BC. Uh, so in, uh, in our ministry, we have a very strong team, trade and both trade and investment teams, and with very rich experience and also multi-bilingual capability to help uh, BC companies uh, to export to, to, to the foreign market, uh, including the Asia, Asia market. 
And also our uh, BC government, our ministry has set up uh, uh, many representatives, trade investment representative offices in Asia, uh, including three offices in China, and office in Japan, Korea, and India, and also in Singapore, and, and, uh, and also in other countries too. So we also have the people on the ground uh, to, to help the, the Canadian companies. And uh, because that the, uh, the, the trade with Asia is so important, uh, with BC, uh, you know that uh, there are several important uh, trade partners in Asia for BC. One of them is China, of course. China and Hong Kong is now the second largest trade partner for BC. And, and also, you know, Japan, uh, trade with Japan, trade with uh, Korea, and also trade with Taiwan are also very important. That's why uh, government, uh, you know, uh, pays great attention uh, to the trade and investment uh, with, with Asia. And, and also that uh, just want to uh, tell every participants that if you want to export to Asia, to Hong Kong, to China, just contact Jerry. We're here to help you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Raymond. And... Um... With the time that we have, I'm um, just going to go through a couple of questions generally for the panel and just feel free anyone to speak up. Is um, one, one important question is, can you comment on the integrity of IP uh, protection in Asia? Because Canada is known for innovation and so that part of it is very important for Canadian companies. Yeah, I think I can jump in just to say, you know, you, you want to have IP protection, your, you know, strategy um, in place. It's part of your preparation. And, and there are ways that you can get this done. There are resources through um, all, all levels, federal, provincial, municipal um, uh, groups, uh, economic development offices, many who might be represented today in, in, in participants, use them. They, they run programming, they run events to help you understand your assets and, and protect them. Um, and it's part of, you know, be it Asia or anywhere, it really is an important part if you're going, going global that you, you understand what you have, what you want to protect, and how to do that. So, you know, I think it's just a, a really good plank and part of your preparation and, and programming um, to, to do. And there are lots of availabilities, um, knowledge centers out there to, to help you along the way, including the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, CEPO. Okay. And, and from what everybody's seen on the panel, what would you say are the top three Canadian business sectors that have successfully expanded into Asia? I'm sure you've dealt with a lot of them, but if the top three could sort of um, boil to the top, what would you say those might be? Well, I can uh, talk about, uh, you know, uh, from my perspective. I think that the, uh, for example, uh, in China, there are a lot of, uh, Opportunities for uh, BC companies, uh, especially in in the in the, in the field of uh, agri-food, agriculture. You know, uh, seafood. This is uh, one of the, you know, the the, the, the Chinese uh, people's uh, living life are improving, and there are now a demand for high quality food. And you know, our our, our Canada and BC can provide this. This is one of them. So the second one is the clean tech. Uh, sectors, and that's also because that the uh, uh, Chinese government is uh, has passed uh, uh, the policies that uh, and also invest a lot of money uh, to develop their clean sec sectors. And we Canadian companies and uh, BC companies have a lot to offer too. And and of of course the. There are so many other sectors that offer opportunities to the Canadian and BC companies, uh, including, for example, the education, mm -hmm. the tourism. You know, I, I know that I know Toby for a long time, and Toby's business has been so su su successful. And just because that the, uh, you know, the Asia and China uh, have a huge market uh, for the BC and Canadian companies. So even though they are 
uh, we, we have uh, challenges. Everybody knows that we are having the challenges. Uh, but uh, for the long term, uh, you know, the Asia, China, China market, Hong Kong market, Taiwan market, they are still very, uh, you know, important uh, uh, markets for the, for, the, for the Canadian companies and BC companies. Thank you, Raymond. And one final question to close off this third segment of the panel this afternoon, or for some is morning. Uh, and Kevin has already spoken to some degree of financial support uh, that are available to entrepreneurs. And so I'd just like to have everyone's comment and input towards uh, generally what sort of financial, additional financial support or grants that might be able um, or might be available for entrepreneurs to access. Additionally, what sort of investor resources and um, access to angel investors that might be available that, or that you could suggest to Canadian entrepreneurs? Shall I take a crack at this one, or Kevin, do you want to? Sure, Sue, if you want to touch on the, on the resources that, uh, that you have, uh, I, I know that. Uh, that's easy. I think, you know, that we're looking at like risk mitigation um, tools. And for the TCS, for the Trade Commissioner Service, we, can, we have a, 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 um, a program called Can Export SME, Small and Medium Sized Enterprise. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a suite of programming under Can Export. There's four pillars, but the one I think that's most of interest to this group is Can Export SME. And it is about getting Canadian companies traction in markets that are new to them. So it is about market diversification. It's a cost share program. So 75% of, of a program or a project that is approved is, is paid for by the government of Canada, supported. And then the client also has a part in that. They pay 25% and they can scope out a project that targets a number of different international markets over a number of months, over a number of different eligible project activities. So it's fantastic. It's super versatile. Um, it is uh, absolutely um, available, of course, across Canada, across all sectors. So it, it really is a great tool and Kevin can speak to it. I'm sure Raymond can speak to it and, 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 um, and I and team can speak to it. No matter which door you enter through, I'm sure that you can get um, anyone online will absolutely um, be introduced to that program if it's a fit for them. And Kevin, did you have anything to add? And, well, just just on on that, um, you know, uh, Chris Bennett raised a, a great uh, point in one of the earlier sessions as well. Is when you do uh, expand into a new country, um, a whole host of new challenges, uh, or into a new market, a whole host of new challenges uh, prop up. Uh, one is is you know the risk of not getting paid. Two is the you know the trade finance solutions that are available through through banks and NEDC. Um, and the the solutions that, that specifically the EEC has is you know sh shore up that risk, which helps on the funding side as well. Um, you know, we don't have grants or, or funding uh, per se, but we can help solidify that that revenue stream, which is very important to, to growing the business and looking at the overall financial uh, requirements of your business and and working back from that. Uh, you know, we, we do have equity uh, matching program as well, uh, you know, very much integrated into the, uh, the venture capital ecosystem as well. So please feel free to reach, reach out um, and uh, we're happy to make introductions. But as, as Sue alluded to at the, at the call, you know, have that business plan down, be able to communicate your vision, your business, uh, you know, the, the, the short, medium, long term. Uh, and we can help uh, introduce to trade accelerator programs and uh, things like that to help uh, formulate that plan, uh, get your export plan set, uh, which which will help you in your 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 efforts to to raise that funding because it's again as uh, as Lindsay mentioned it's a it's a tough slog uh, particularly in early days um, so the more mentors and the more planning out and execution you can you can do uh, the easier it comes and then the investors come to you which, uh, which yeah. we're all. In. Thank you, Kevin. I, I would like to. Uh, I would like to just introduce a few uh, programs that BC government uh, funded, and besides the, uh, the the trade accelerator program that we uh, BC government funded together with the federal government, uh, all, we also uh, funded uh, what we call the export nav navigator program, and these two programs uh, are, are helping the the BC companies uh, to get prepared 
to export to the foreign markets, no matter what the, their stage is, and then we're helping them to get prepared. And there's also another, another uh, program the BC government funded is called the Launch Online uh, Program. And uh, that is uh, the BC government is funded the, the BC companies to uh, prepare their online capabilities in, in the hope of uh, exporting their products online. So uh, if you know, any companies are interested in uh, export to Asia, to China, contact Jerry, uh, that's uh, our ministry, uh, Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and uh, uh, Innovation. And we we'll also have the team on the ground to help you guys. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jerry. <laughs> uh, thank you. So for those that are veterans to import and exporting, and those are new to the game, it's great to have the government riding shotgun with us on our road trip to Asia, because we don't want to be ending up trying to call roadside assistance. 